All right, welcome back. It's February 1st. Uh, we're going to go into JFK assassination video number 55. Wow. All right, so we're going to continue with Bill Frazier's testimony. Keep going down the, the line, looking for those diamonds, and sifting through this big pile of shit, like I said, called the Warren Commission. All right, so it says, Mr. Ball, when you stood out in front of the parade, uh, looking at the parade, where was Shelley standing, and where was Lovelady standing with reference to you? So they're asking this question because Shelley's the supervisor, so they're going mostly by what he said for the Warren Commission. And then Lovelady, there's that photo that looks like Oswald sitting in the front steps, but people are, the FBI is saying it's Lovelady, so they're trying to figure that out. Well, and that's what I'm saying. You can always tell what's on someone's mind or their agenda by the questions they ask, okay, or the statements they make. Well, see, I was standing, like I say, one step down on the top, and Mr. Shelley was standing, you know, back from the top step over towards the side of the wall there. You see, now that right there, that sounds like prayer man. Because if you've got, let me pull my... Uh, little thing up here. Hold on one second. All right, so here we go. So here's the steps. There's the railing. Billy Lovelady's like right here, about the second or third step. You got Frazier on the first step here. And he's saying that Bill Shelley, his supervisor, is standing up one step and to the right of him. Okay. Let's see if we can get a better picture here. Nah, that's about it. So supposedly prayer man is right here so prayer man would be standing right next to Bill Shelley okay so don't you think that if the FBI and everybody else starts saying hey Oswald shot the president from the sixth floor that Billy Lovelady Frazier and Bill Shelley would say no no he was he was standing here right beside us right behind me right to the right of me Okay. Now, I don't know who Prayer Man is. Okay. Somehow, the people who do the Prayer Man thing have done a list of everybody in the building, and they've eliminated everybody's location and determined that there's only one person left, and that's Oswald. And I had, so it, therefore, deduction, it had to be Oswald. Well, that that's ridiculous because any fool can come walking by here. The postman could have been picking up the mail and decided to stand up here on the steps. Anybody could be making a delivery. You know, we had this guy coming by with his guns, showing his guns. There's always people going in and out to these offices there. So this could be anyone, okay? Just because you have a list and you eliminate them and find out, well, it must be Oswald, that's not true, okay? So, and then what you're doing when you're saying that is that Oswald, you know, you're saying that um, Mr. Truly, um, Officer Baker, the lady who was in the lunchroom, and Victoria Adams are all full of shit, okay? You can't, you can't have it always. Okay, and what I do is I go with what most people are saying. Okay, the general consistency of most people in the beginning. Okay, because that's where you're going to find the truth at. And so all these people were making these statements in the very, very beginning. Somebody would have said, "Hey, I, no, I saw Oswald. You know, it couldn't have been him." Everybody knows. Okay, by later that day, it's Oswald. Okay, who? the police are saying are guilty. So when they're making their statements, they're going to say, no, I saw Oswald. He was on the front steps. He was in the back lunchroom. All these things. My problem is, if Oswald went down to the first floor lunchroom, like he said, and finished his lunch and then talked to other people, even talked to Bill Shelley in the back dock, why aren't they saying anything? Okay. I think the truth is somewhere in between that Oswald came down from the second floor, went out the back door, came around, 
Houston and they went up Elm going up to the Carousel Club or the Adolphus Hotel. It's somewhere in there. We're going to find out, though. Okay? And the reason why Oswald would cover that up, you know, I'm not sure. All right, so. Well, see, I was standing, like I say, one step down from the top, and Mr. Shelley was standing, you know, back from the top step and over towards the side wall there. See, again, when you look at that, he was standing here. Bill Shelley was standing here over towards the side wall. So that's Bill Shelley where they're saying prayer man is at. Okay? All right. And then Billy was a couple of steps down. The Billy Lovelady was a couple of steps down from me over towards more the wall also. Mr. Ball, usually when Lee walked into the building in the morning, when you came to work with him, where did he go? Do you know? See... You notice how they completely shift the focus there, okay? So what does that tell you? They're trying to head off this conversation that Frazier is talking about the people on the steps. So there's some reason they're doing that. Anyway, it says, no, sir, he just walked in, say, like inside the building, like I say, I always went and put my lunch up there and hang my jacket or coat up, whichever I wore, and he was usually around there on the first floor there after some of them put their lunch in the refrigerator. So far as as that, I never paid too much attention to what he usually did. You usually walked in together? That is right, sir. And you separated after you got there? Yes, after we got into the interior, I just went and put my lunch up. Did you notice where Lee kept his lunch? No, sir, I didn't. Did you ever see him come into the building on the other days than the days he rode with you? You mean, did I ever see him come in the building when he rode with me? Yes. Yes, sir, because when he rode with me, he we always walked together. No other, no, other than when he rode with you. Oh, on the other, other than when he rode with me, no, sir, I didn't. Did he have any particular associates around that uh, there that you knew of? All right. Not that I knew of. I say he didn't mingle with guys like the rest of us. The rest of us usually joked back and forth with practically everybody who worked around there. But he usually kept to himself, and that was the only time he talked to anybody was when he wanted to know something about a book or something like that. So don't you think it's strange that Oswald, this lowly, almost uneducated um, communist, okay, who's picking fights in New Orleans and talking with, you know, some of the richest people in town, the white Russians, who are not communists, okay, and hanging out with DeMorne Shield to the late late hours and talking whatever he's not talking with people of his own class he's not goofing off he's not um, playing dominoes he's not playing cards he's not talking about you know his new rifle he bought he's not talking about uh, the new baby being born nothing like that that's how most people do they usually hang out in their own class and they talk about their own shit now, the times that they don't do that, okay, means they're antisocial, which Oswald obviously was not antisocial. You look at him in Russia, he's like the bell of the ball, the center of attention, okay? You look at him around these right Russians, he's going to these parties, he's trying to learn words to keep up with them. He's hanging out with the Mornschild. So he's not, obviously not antisocial, okay? Now, People can act antisocial and not be antisocial, okay? They're just putting on an act for certain people. Because different people see different people different ways, okay? We're not always the same. Generally, and that's how you can tell the general character of someone, is what the consensus is among a majority of people that have interacted with a person. 
So Oswald's obviously doing something that he normally wouldn't do and acting a way that he normally wouldn't act. And we're going to find out because when we talk to people at his other, when we listen, excuse me, to the testimony of other people at his other jobs, it's going to be a completely different Oswald. Okay? All right. So the only thing you can think of, I can think of, if you're an informant and you've been told to take this job at this Texas School Book Depository, the reason why you're antisocial and not saying much is you're keeping your eyes and ears open. Okay? You're watching people. That's what you've been told to do. Keep quiet and keep your ears open. That's what I think Oswald's doing. Okay? You don't want to become friends with the enemy that you're monitoring. Okay? That That's my supposition. That's what it seems like to me. Okay? All right. We'll keep going on here. So it says, we've got a picture taken from the day of the parade that shows the president's car going by. Now, take a look at the pit, that picture. Can you see your picture? Can you see your picture any place there? No, sir, I don't, because I was back up in more or less the black area here. Okay, okay so they're asking if he can see himself. And you can't. I see. Because Billy, like I said, is two or three steps down in front of me. Do you recognize this fellow? That is Billy. Billy. That is Billy Lovelady. Billy? Right. See? So now you can tell by their questions that there are people coming out saying, hey, that looks like Oswald. And, of course, it's not Oswald. So they're trying to eliminate that. Right. Let's mark. Let's take a marker and mark an arrow down that way. That mark is Billy Lovelady. Right. That is where you told us you were standing a moment ago. Right. In front of you to the right. In front of you to the right over to the wall. Yes. Is this a commission ex exhibit? We will make this commission exhibit 369. That is written in. The arrow marks Billy Lovelady on commission exhibit number 369. Do you have any lockers there in which you put your clothes and so forth? No, sir, we don't. See, now they're trying to narrow it down with the jacket here, okay? Representative Ford withdrew from the hearing room. Some boys hang their jackets up in there in that little domino room where they were going to play dominoes. But here lately, I've been wondering, you know, most of us wear jackets that we have on because if you're going out there on the dock in the cold air we usually keep them on so the question arises what happened to Oswald's jacket why did he leave the jacket okay um, supposedly in the domino room and why does Frazier say that the uh, the jacket found in the domino room is not the jacket that he was wearing that Oswald was wearing so this is what I say if the president got shot, Oswald's trying to figure out what happened. He goes out the back door, comes around Houston, goes up Elm, goes up over to the carousel to see if Ruby is there. Okay. Because it's noon, so Ruby should start getting in. Finds out that Ruby's uh, place is closed. Or maybe he meets Ruby. And Ruby says, you know, look, just go home. We'll figure this out. Go go back. I'll meet you at the Texas Theater, and we'll talk about this later uh, when things have cooled down. So that would give Oswald reason not to go back to the Texas School, Bo or Texas School Book Depository and pick up his jacket. He's been told by Ruby. He's been told by a handler over at the Adolphus. Somebody, look, just... Meet me at the Texas. Meet, meet your contact. Meet a contact at the Texas School Book Depository. I'm excuse me, the Texas Theater. Here, take this half of a playing car card, but don't go back to the Texas School Book Depository until you know let things cool down. So go to the theater there, okay? So that's what he does, okay? That's what I believe happens, and then whoever shoots 
whether it's Patrick Hemming or Crayford, whoever shoots Tippett makes their way to the Texas School Book to excuse me, the Texas Theater to draw the attention of the police to catch Oswald. That's one scenario. Who knows exactly what happened? All right, so we'll keep going. And let's see, do you have any lockers in which the... Okay. Da, da, da. I see, on Thursday afternoon when you went home, drove on home, did he carry any package with him? No, sir, he didn't. Did he have a jacket or coat with him? Yes, sir. What kind of jacket or coat did he have? That, you know, like I say, great jacket. That same great jacket? Yes, sir. Now, I can be frank with you. I had seen him wear the jacket several times because it's a cool type like when you keep a jacket on all day and if you work on outs on outside in something like that you wouldn't go outside with just a plain shirt on Mr. Ball Wow I have no further questions so then they just completely stopped there Sen Chairman Senator have any questions you would like to ask I think that is all does anyone else have any questions to ask? Do you have any questions? Mr. Ball, Mr. Frazier, we have here exhibit 364, which is a sack, and uh, in what we have put a dismantled gun. Oh, so now we're back to the sack again. Uh, don't pay any attention to that. Would you stand up here, oh, here we go, and put this under your arm and then take hold of it at the side? Now, is that anywhere near similar to the way that Oswald carried the package? Well, you know, like I said now, I said I didn't pay much attention. Turned around. I didn't pay much attention. But when I did, I say he had this part down here, like the bottom would be short. He cupped in his hands like that and say, like walking on the back, if you had a big arm jack, big arm jacket, where you wouldn't tell much from the package there, of physical features. Good Lord, Frazier's just really hard to read. If you could see it from the front like when you walk and met somebody, you could tell about the package. But walking from behind, you couldn't tell much about the package whatsoever about the width. So that blows one thing right there. So if Oswald is trying to carry the package into the Texas School Book Depository with nobody seeing it, the package under his arm, it wouldn't work because Frazier said you can't see it from behind but you can see it from the front. Wow. But he didn't carry it from the back. If this package was shorter he would have cupped it in his hands. Could you could he have the top of it behind his shoulder or are you sure it was cupped under the shoulder there? Yes because the way it looked you know like I say he had it cupped in his hand. I beg your pardon? I said, from where I noticed, he had it cupped in his hands. I don't see how he could have it anywhere other than under the armpit. Because if you had it cupped in your hand, it would stick over it. Would he have carried it this way? No, sir. Never in front here like that. Now, that is what I'm talking to you about. No, I say he couldn't have because if he had had if he had you would have seen the package sticking up like that so he's completely dismissing the Dan Rather bullshit okay so you see Dan Rather cup the package and has part of the rifle sticking up in front of his shoulder and Frazier just blew that away and said that's not what happened okay from what I I've seen walking behind he had it under his arm and couldn't tell that he had the package from the back. When you cup the back, let's see, when you cup the bottom of the package, when you cup the bottom of the package in your hands, will you stand up again, please, and the upper part of the package is not under the armpit, and the top of the package extends almost up to the level of your ear. So it's amazing how much effort they go in to try to make it what well, could have been this way could have been that way could have been this way and it's real obvious what's going on it's 24 inches the package length Oswald cups the package 
with his fingers, he puts the rest of the package in its armpit, and from its armpit to his fingertips, that's 24 inches. So they're trying to make reality Mr. Ball and the rest of the Warren Commission are trying to bend reality to the scenario that they want instead of, you know, they've been told by the FBI and the other, you know, Mr. Ball and everyone else that, hey, this is what he did. This is how he got the weapon in there. But the weapon's 41 inches, and Oswald cup the package with his right hand and then put the rest in his armpit, which is 24 inches. There's no way it'll work. So this is why they're having difficult with it, because they've been told this is what happened, but then the reality is starting to hit, and then they're thinking, well, maybe it could have been like this, and maybe it could have been like that. This is what they're doing here, okay? Right. Or your eye level, and when you put the package under your armpit, the upper part of the package and take a hold of the side of it with your right hand it extends an approximately eight inches above the span of the hand more than eight inches eight to ten inches so let's just think about that again if the rifle broken down is 41 inches and Os uh, Frazier is saying it's 24 inches it's actually 17 inches okay about a foot and a half so it's not just 8 inches, it's not just 10 inches, it's 17 inches, twice as far as what they're trying to say. And if you're using a yardstick or one of these little, I was using my hand. I know you were, but there are some different means to measure it. I will say it varies. If you use a yardstick, you can go and measure something with a tape measure with a yardstick and come up with a different measurement altogether maybe a quarter of an inch shorter or longer. So even Oz, even Frazier is, you know, reasonable and putting in like, yeah, well, yeah, it could be a, a quarter of an inch and an half an inch difference, okay? But he's very sure what the distance was. And if you look at Frazier, he's actually taller than Oswald. All right. I asked... Okay. Mr. Ball, I was asked there was some uncertainty in the testimony as to the direction from which you heard the shots fired. Let's see if we can illustrate it. So, they've gone, they've pushed reality as far as they can. They've hit a wall. They know that it's not going to get any better for them. So they cut off the testimony and they move on to something else. So this is what you do, okay, when your version of the truth will say Mr. Ball's version of the truth is over here okay and then there's another version of the truth over here but the real version of the truth is in the middle you try to push these as close together as you can but they never seem to merge so what do you do you stop talking about that before it starts to settle in with the with the uh, rest of the commission members, okay, and you move on to something else. All right. You heard the shots fired, and you expressed an opinion that it came from a certain direction. I would like to clear that up, if you could, on this map here in the Texas School Book Depository building. You were standing right here, and you said, uh, "You said, weren't you? Can you tell me?" You know, the entrance there is not quite at the corner. That close. Now, you say you heard three sounds, which you later thought were probably shots. You thought it came from a certain direction. Can you tell us from what direction and, illustr and as illustrated on the map? Right. Now, I say, you know we're in the straight curve that goes under the underpass. That is the parkway. Right. He's talking about the grassy knoll. Right. I say it runs over... This parkway, you don't have you don't have it on there anyway. I say these railroad tracks, there is a series of them that come up over this up by the overpass, and from where I was standing I say it is my true opinion that is where I thought it sounded like it came from. From over there in the railroad tracks. 
That would be east and south? No. That would be west and south. West and south? No. It would be... No. It would be north. No. It wouldn't be north. Yes. It would be south because that is that direction. This is north and you say it. I believe it came from north. And it would be more or less west north from these tracks from this overpass. All right, let's clarify what he's saying here. All right, here's Zilli Plaza. Here is the Texas School Book Depository. The steps are right there. This is the grassy knoll. There's a railroad yard. Okay, so we all know that the streets run north, south, east, west. So this, or generally, this is north. This is west, this is south, and this is east. So he's saying west, west from the steps, and north. Okay, so that means around this general area here. All right, so now we've clarified that because, see, they're trying to make it confusing again to the reader and to the, the person that's being questioned. And then he says, over by the railroad tracks. Okay, here's the railroad tracks right here. All right, so actually, we've reached the end of our time here, and we'll, we're going to stop, and then we're going to pick this up another time. All right, take care. All right, we're back into this uh, interview again with George the Mornshield with uh, William Altmans. Our interest in Lee and Marina Oswald remained that we only wanted to help them. My philosophy is life in life not to bend in front of the strong people and be nice to the poor, as nice as I can. If they annoyed me, I did not pay a show it, because it's like insulting a beggar. So if sometimes Lee annoyed annoyed me, I didn't show it to him. Well, this week, uh, from then on, I think we should start now on, if we have time, on the, we can start, yes, on the element, on the, on the chapter F, the increasing, which I called increasing animosity. The increasing animosity which existed between Lee and Marina Oswald, and I think we showed it in the previous chapter, how it slowly developed. Uh, looking back, and remembering Lee's relation to other people, I must admit that he was rather standoffish, spoke civilly only to people who happened to be in of interest to him and whom he liked, and these were not many. He mentioned very rarely his mother, never criticized her, but neither had he any kind words for her. Neither did Marina. We have never met Lee's mother, but we admire her efforts, as awkward as they may be in trying to clear up the name of her son. We wish her the best of luck in these endeavors. So, let's say something about um, Marguerite real quick. So, if you remember, there was kind of this estranged relationship with Marguerite and um, Oswald. He lived with her for a while and they got their own place in Fort Worth. He didn't really associate with her that much. I mean, she was an eccentric, you know. She had like, what, three husbands. One of them died, maybe two of them died. She was an eccentric Southern woman. Typical eccentric Southern woman, okay? And then Lee was, you know, trying to be kind and respectful, being that was her mother, but also realizing that she may have been a little crazy, okay? Now, the thing that bothers me about some people is that, even the critics today, is that they try to associate that because the mother was maybe crazy, Therefore, she raised a crazy son. 
is completely ridiculous because you look. I mean, look at um, look at Robert Oswald. Look at his um, other brother, William Pick. Don't you think they would have been crazy too? How come they didn't turn out to be Marxists and you know wild revolutionary fanatics? Okay. I will say one thing about the youngest son. I'm a youngest son, and it's usually, if you look at it, in most families, the older son is usually the most responsible, business-oriented, probably ends up being Republican, things like that. It's usually the younger son that turns out to be more adventurous, more uh, less establishment, and you know things like that or anti-establishment whatever but um, also Marguerite was one of the first persons okay to bring some insight into about a double identity for Oswald okay she was the one that went to Washington and then talked to the FBI saying that hey somebody's using Oswald's passport, okay, while he's in Russia. And they wanted to know what was going on with that. Now, if you think about that, okay, I mean, I'm not naive, okay, I know how the world works. Um, the government if they know they sent someone on a mission somewhere, okay, or that someone has passed away, the U.S. government may know that, but other governments may not. And they may use someone's passport with someone, an individual that looks similar to that person to carry out missions, covert intelligence, things like that, by using their passport. It happens all the time. Happens probably more than you th than you know. Okay. So if you've got also. So what they're what I'm saying is that the CIA, the FBI, whoever may assume someone American citizen's identity. Okay. That is maybe in prison or maybe. they're incapacitated maybe a mental institution or maybe they're in a coma things like that it wouldn't be beyond the realm to believe these things because they could use a real birth certificate they could use a real background information and all you need to do is just make them up a little bit I mean think about it how many people look very very similar that not given a second glance they could pass to the same person. Okay. It happens quite a bit. I, I would assume that the Russians are doing it. We're doing it. You know, I do remember there was in a case in Abu Dhabi in uh, United Arab Emirates where a terrorist, he's either in Hamas, I believe he was in Hamas, was killed in his hotel room and they attributed it to Mossad. But the thing was, the people's passports that they used were assumed identities of actual real people in Israel and other countries. And they started interviewing those people, and they're like, no, no, I never went there, it wasn't me. So what happened is, you know, I lived in Israel, and when you get to Israel, you have to surrender your passport for a couple of days and then they make copies and crap like that and I'm sure what they would do is they would keep a database okay of foreign passports they like Irish especially in Australia and New Zealand matter of fact New Zealand got upset filed a protest even Aust even Ireland filed a protest because some of these people that were used had passports from those countries so what that tells you is that the government will assume, a government agent will assume someone's identity of a real person when they know that person's not going to be, you know, 
in that area or maybe it's incapacitated. I've heard, especially them using criminals, okay, people that are in prison, incarcerated, they can't get out, they can't do anything, okay. So they use their passport to, to go do things around the world. That's what they did in Abu Dhabi. I, I personally don't understand why they would have allowed themselves to get caught on camera because that's how the the secret police of of United Arab Emirates so to find him. There were just all these cameras everywhere. But if you watch the videos, you see that, you know, every time there was a camera, they were always putting their hand in front of their face or they had a hat on or they had sunglasses, all these kinds of things. So they knew where the camera is at and they knew how to avoid this, you know, avoid direct, you know, someone looking directly at them. So, again, with Marguerite Oswald, she was saying that someone was using her son's identity and passport, and she wanted to find out what was really going on. There's also someone was trying to buy Jeeps to send to Cuba using the name of Oswald. Someone was trying to buy guns using the name of Oswald in 1962. So... You know, you could look at that two ways. You could actually say, was there Oswald really in Russia? Or was he running around the U.S. trying to buy Jeeps and stuff? I tend to think that it's the real Oswald because Marguerite, excuse me, um, his wife, I can't remember her name right now, Marina, would have recognized the difference there. Okay. Anyway, so that's enough of the the fake Oswalds there. And Marguerite. All right. All right. So they got a little gap here. Let's move forward. Upon there their arrival from Russia, and probably they had usual domestic clashes during this forced cohabitation. To my wife, it was clear why it was difficult to tolerate Marina in one's house for any length of time. She liked to stay in bed till noon or later, uh, preferably abhorred domestic chores, and furthermore, there must have been a complete language barrier. You know that case. because you know the long sleeping because she also stayed in your house. No? Yes, she stayed in yeah. our house yeah. and yeah. we recall this incident. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Same thing uh, was the uh, same opinion my, my own daughter had of Marina and her lack of cooperation in the domestic chores and the fact that she slept very, la very late. So, Let's talk about that real quick. You can look at that in various different ways that you got the Marina, the go-getter, okay, who now she's in America, she's thinking she doesn't have to work like she did in the Soviet Union, but now she has children that she has to take care of. She's not used to that. She also could be depressed, you know. She's in America, away from her family, forced to do this mission for the KGB, okay. She's got a crazy husband. She's got pregnant by this guy. Now she's got to take care of these kids. Or, or you could think, well, why is she sleeping till noon? Maybe she's up all night. What is she doing all night? Okay, you got to think about that too. Maybe she's prowling around. Maybe she's running around doing super secret, you know, KGB asset snooping. There's various ways to look at that. Okay. And, but again, it could just be that she's lazy or depressed. Lee was not the average eager, go-getting type of a person, like excuse his brother me, Robert. Excuse me, George, at that point. Mm -hmm. Can I ask Jeanne a question? Yes. Jeanne, uh, when she slept late, didn't you say something about that she then let the children also uh, wait until she woke up? That she, that she wasn't looking after the children, wasn't that? Well, she had a one child at that time. Whenever she slept late, the child just slept with her. It was amazing. 
And for a little baby, usually they cry at 6 o'clock, and mother gets up, gives them a bottle. But that child, amazing, they just slept right there with her. And whenever she gets up, then she feels... Also, another thing, if you want to think about it, she tried writing back to the Soviet Union embassy about going back, requesting to be able to return to the Soviet Union in, like, January, February. And around that same time, she found out she was pregnant again. So if they're talking about her sleeping till noon after February, it could be that she's homesick, wants to go back, but not allowed to, and now she's pregnant again with this crazy fool's baby. And then, you know, there are a lot of women that have depression when they're, when they're um, pregnant, so that could be part of the symptom. There could just be nothing more than that. The child. But child also very often was kept up very late. So maybe that was the reason that uh, yeah. the child could sleep longer in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Lee was not the average. Oh, excuse me. Also, one more thing. If you think about it, if Oswald is working from 8 to f or getting up at like 6.30 or so, or seven, going to work and then coming back close to five. She, she's just sitting there. If she got up while he was at work, she's just sitting at at home doing nothing. You know, domestic chores, whatever. That could be boring after a while playing with the child. So maybe she slept until noon. Okay. Because that gave her more time with Lee at night for them to be a family, them to play with the children, to be together as a family. You can think of it that way. Eager go-getting type of a person, like his brother Robert. And he did not admire such people. I often thought it was a pity Lee did not have a better education. He might have done well in the scholastic world and would have made a useful citizen. But fate was not to be kind to him. His relations with Marine Again, you know, like I said, they try to paint Oswald as being crazy because, you know, Marguerite's a little eccentric, a little crazy herself. But that doesn't make much sense when you look at William Pick, her other sons, William Pick and Robert Oswald. They turned out completely different. So, you know... Of course, Robert says that, you know, um, Lee was handpicked or whatever by his mother. Anyway, we'll keep going. Marina worsened every day now, and Marina began to ask my wife for a permission to spend a night with us or some time with her without Lee, with us without Lee. She confided in her unhappiness of having been abused physically. She, by the way, when she stayed with us, wore my wife's silk nightgowns and sometimes spent the night on the sofa in our living room. She also took the baby to my daughter's apartment in Farm Mount. In the meantime, while all this was going on, Lee kept on working over time, reading his Russian books, maybe sulking, but always proud, always meticulously honest, paying his bills and living like a hermit. Do you get to what kind of books he was reading and all that? Yeah, I think I should, ma I should mention that uh, whenever I saw Lee reading, he read Russian classics which are difficult for a fellow who was not born in Russia to read. He, re he read Turgenev, Pushkin, Dostoevsky, Gogol, uh, Lermontov, liked Russian poetry and, and took out of the library exclusively good classical books. Uh, did you say he also listened, for instance, to Tchaikovsky's Queen of Spades? That he I think so. I think he had uh, uh, his favorite. That was his favorite. So he did listen to classical music? Yes, yes, he liked classical music and he liked r Russian folk music too. They had a lot of Russian records. One moment, George. 
No, to remember back, the yeah. point of their disagreements and more and more quarrels and fights started that uh, Marina was corresponding with her ex-boyfriend mm. in Russia. And Lee intercepted that letter. And from then on, the fights became quite bitter. Mm -hmm. Oh, she did have a... She so, again, you want to think that it may not have been an ex-boyfriend, okay? Or it could have been an ex-boyfriend. If you look at it one way, yeah, it could have been an ex-boyfriend. Maybe this is this Rahab guy She's they're talking about, this Moroccan guy. Maybe, also, it could have been and KGB. And Lee recognized some kind of code writing that she was doing, and therefore that increased a lot of suspicion on her that maybe, like he was being told by the FBI or whoever his handlers were, to watch out for your wife because she's probably working and writing back to the KGB. So you could look at it like that also, but, you know, again, any natural uh, thing like that, natural situation, um, any husband would be jealous if, you know, your wife is writing back uh, not too much to fear because the guy's in Soviet Union is what, it's not like he's going to come over there every day or something like that so um, but then again like I said it could increase a lot of animosity if Lee suspected that maybe she was writing back to her handler and KGB or boyfriend KGB whatever it would be he had a, yes before and she uh, started to correspond with that young man. I assume it was young man. And <coughs> and then she she almost was going to go. go, ahead, go ahead. She almost was planning to go back to Russia. And that's at at any rate, that's what Lee thought mm -hmm. that she maybe wants to go back to Russia to this boyfriend. But yeah, it was a trade, And but. yes, and from then on, they start more and more quarrels. And then his objections to her smoking. That she is, she was a real chain smoker, constant cigarette after cigarette, and a drink, a change, uh, objection, uh, objecting to her drinking wine. I never saw her drinking anything else. But again, you want to think about it like this: if she was so dead set on going back to the Soviet Union, okay, why didn't she go after Oswald was shot? So what that tells you, she like remarried almost immediately. So what that tells you is that she wanted to stay in the Soviet. She wanted to stay in America, just not with Oswald. That's what it tells me there. And again, now Russians smoke a lot. Now I, being in Israel, Israelis smoke a lot. Okay, it's amazing that Israelis smoke a lot, but they have one of the longest longevities almost up there with Japan, it's like in the top five, and that's because they have national health care and uh, socialized medicine. Same thing with Japan. Japan has socialized medicine, and that's why the Japanese live longer than anyone else. But anyway, regardless of that, um, if you think about the smoking part, what does that mean? Why is she smoking all the time like that? It could be habit, but it also could be to cover up some kind of nervousness. She's in a foreign country. She's got this crazy husband. She's trying to fulfill her mission with NKGB. Her only outlet is her smoking and drinking. This is what she's doing. At wine, but he was such an asket himself. He objected to that. And of course, the more he objected, the more she did both things. So from then on, the life became worse and worse, and yeah, more yeah. quarrelsome, more quarrelsome. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And also about the baby, he was so uh, adored the child to such an uh, extent that if a child make one little sound, and if Marina is not right there in this instant, he was already furious with Marina. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Marina took care of her sufficiently well. But to him, nothing was good enough. That child was something like uh, out Would of this world. Would you say he was a him. perfectionist? Absolute perfectionist. And that child, it was his idol. Mm -hmm. Absolute idol. And just expression on his face when he looked at that baby. 
It was un unbelievable. So it's my understanding from stuff that I've read about what they did in the Soviet Union is they did experiments, okay? Now, most Soviets or most Russians are very child-oriented and very friendly and very concerned about their children's attention and things like that. But the communists in the Soviet Union did experiments where they would take children from parents, okay? And then the children would start crying and they would leave the children in these empty rooms by themselves crying for hours just to see and then they would note these things and then they would note to see how the children turned out when they were much older um, they found out there was a great difference between the children whose parents are more attentive and the children who are left alone to cry by themselves that you know a lot of them were more likely to be criminals um, less you know emotional uh, things like that, but see, they were actually looking for people like that to use as you know as assets for the KGB. So that actually worked out good for the the communists there. Such a young man and having so many other interests in life was unbelievable. He was excellent father. In fact, he was too good because he sponsor, uh, sponsored <coughs> to spoil the he child. He cuddled it too much. He cuddled too it. much. Yes. Yeah, and see. it was hard on Marina too because she was with the baby all day long mm -hmm. and he saw the baby just for a short little yeah, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was two different things. But that also added a lot to their quarrels. His complaint that and she was not adequate. And these quarrels took money. often place in your presence and George's presence. Uh, they quarreled in front of us. They never fought in front of us. But they quarreled quite, quite bitterly. And then, of course, probably continue quarreling home and the next day with some marina with black eye or with some bruises on her that actually happened yeah. they actually and so think about that okay so they're quarreling so they have to be quarreling in russian okay so oswald was speaking russian well enough that he could quarrel with his own wife i know that sounds small thing but no one ever reports Oswald speaking Russian to them at his works, at his jobs, nothing. Any words, no, you know, he didn't drop a book and say some curse word in, in Russian. No one ever heard him do this, okay? So don't you think that's kind of strange that he was that controlled that he could turn on Russian, turn on English whenever he, he chose to? Anyway, so I'm at my time here, so I'm going to stop, and we'll move on to the next section. All right, so we were talking about American rights and civil rights and how these were being denied Oswald and how that relates to Oswald, but also it's an American tradition of not giving people rights and taking away people's rights, okay? So... African Americans weren't afforded on paper the rights of a citizen until after the Civil War, after the country had been a nation almost a hundred years. And then it took almost another hundred years for them to actually achieve, you know, legally um, equality with other citizens of the U.S. to the Civil Rights Movement. There were Jim Crow laws that prevented citizens born in the United States who happened to be of Afri African American descent from attaining those rights. And then during the 30s, excuse me, during the 40s, because of fear that Americans of Japanese descent were had their rights taken away, they weren't just not allowed to vote they had their property taken away they weren't just had their businesses shut down their farms taken away their homes were taken away their personal property was taken away they weren't just allowed to just leave and go live someplace else they had their liberty and their freedom taken away and were put in concentration camps okay in America under a liberal democratic president out of fear 
No laws were passed. No due process. No cases. None of these ever went to court. No due process was afforded these people. Their rights were just taken away by the order of the President of the United States.